Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, Global Climate Change Week event that is jointly hosted by the National Institute for Applied Statistics Research Australia, uh, that's NIASRA, and uh, the Consortium uh, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future um, Safe. So my name is Andrew Zamit Manjon, uh, and like Xiao Chen, uh, I'm a member of this uh, joint uh, uh, collaboration uh, between NIASRA and SAFE. Uh, and what we do in this uh, collaboration is develop new statistical methodology for uh, Antarctic studies. So every year, NIASRA tries to uh, contribute to the Global Climate Change Week uh, by giving a seminar uh, to highlight any research uh, which is at the interface of uh, statistical methodology and environmental sciences. Um, and what we are doing that relates to climate change. So this year, I am very happy that we've got uh, Xiao Chen Zeng here to talk to us about his recent work uh, on Antarctic biodiversity modeling with uncertainty quantification, uh, on how statistics can help us understand uh, better the biodiversity in Antarctica, and ultimately to see how it will be impacted uh, by climate change. Uh, Dr. Xiao Chen Zeng uh, is a research fellow with Nayaz Ran Safe, who received his PhD in statistical science uh, from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Although he had just started his uh, academic career, he has already won paper awards from two major associations in statistics, that's the American Statistical Association and the International Society for Bayesian Analysis. His research interests broadly lie in parametric and non-parametric statistical methods uh, for complex and dependent data. Before we start the talk, uh, I'd like to invite everybody here uh, to join us for coffee after the talk at uh, Panizzi uh, for further discussion. Uh, the drinks will be sponsored by the Global Climate Change Week organizing team here at UOW. Uh, since this is a climate change event, if you can get uh, heat cups with you, that would be appreciated. Um, so without further ado, um, your turn. Okay, um, thanks for the coffee. And um, um, I'm, um, thank you for everyone for being here uh, in person, either in Zoom. And today I'm going to talk about uh, Antarctic um, biodiversity modeling with uncertainty quantification. So there are three uh, keywords here Antarctic, biodiversity, and uncertainty. So these three words will form the contents of um, from today's talk. Okay, so first I want to acknowledge SAFE, the Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. Uh, that funds this uh, research, and SAFE is a special uh, research initiative funded by Australian Research Council. And here is a screenshot of uh, the mission of SAFE. Um, our mission is to understand past, present, and future change in the Antarctic region, and to use this understanding to help make the best decisions for its future and ours. So I'm glad to be part of it. And and I also want to thank um, our collaborators. So we have uh, Noor and Andrew from the University of Wollongong. They are also my advisors for my postdoc, and they have been giving me a lot of advice on our research. And also I want to thank uh, Professor Melody and David uh, from the Chop University, especially thanks to David who has been teaching me a lot of uh, the ecology. So, yep. And today I'm going to talk about um, biodiversity. So biodiversity is a word to describe all life forms on this planet. So breaking it down, we have different levels of um, biodiversity. So genetic diversity uh, refers to the variation of genes that exist within a species. So a high uh, variation of the, of the genes within a species often indicates that, that the species is probably more, um, more, um, more adaptable to the environment and the changes in, in the environment. And we also have species diversity, which refers to uh, the variety of the species in, in a system. And of course, high diverse, uh, species diversity of many case, the ecosystem's health. And speaking of ecosystem, we also have ecosystem diversity, which refers to different characteristics of the ecosystem. For example, we have deserts, we have rainforests, we have coral reef, and also it refers to interactions uh, between the species within the ecosystem and the interactions between the species and the ecosystem. So we can see that biodiversity is not far away from us, it's around us, it's in our daily life. And usually high biodiversity is, is considered indicators of ecosystem health because with high biodiversity, we have a lot of species within the system 
for us to perform uh, the functions necessary for the ecosystem to survive. So low cyber biodiversity can be harmful to the system. And it's very important to monitor the changes in biodiversity. And zoom in a little bit, we're gonna look at Antarctic biodiversity today. And this is a very nice picture that I found in Stephen's paper in 2015, which gives us a big picture of not only the Antarctica, but also how Antarctica is interacting with the rest of the world. And this is the, and this is the view uh, from the sky directly above the, of the Antarctica responding to the stereographic projection. So we can see that here, the ocean surrounding the Antarctica is the Southern Ocean, which comprises of more than 800, 8,000 marine species. So we have a very rich marine biodiversity in Antarctica. And these uh, currents, these two currents, this AOACC, Antarctic Circumpolar cur uh, Current, and this ACOC, Antarctic Coastal Occurrence, are the main drivers of the, of the distributions of the, of the marine species in the Southern Ocean. And regarding the continent's um, biodiversity, uh, most of the biodiversity in the continent of Antarctica are exclusively in the ice-free areas um, of the Antarctica, which are only less than 1% of the Antarctica continent. And these are uh, the ice-free areas in the Antarctica, indicated by, highlighted by these uh, colors. They are, most of them are around the coastal line of the continent. And we can see, and, and for example, here is the, one of the main ice-free areas the Antarctic uh, Peninsula. And climate change has a lot of impacts on the Antarctica, either directly to Antarctica or indirectly from, um, from, from the interactions between Antarctica and, and other continents and the ocean. So um, for example, uh, the Southern Ocean, we have, uh, it has been suggested that the Southern Ocean is the main, I uh, have observed the majority of uh, excess greenhouse related warming. So because the rise, the, the, the rise of the temperature in the Southern Ocean will affect the life of the marine science and the biodiversity there. And regarding um, the continent's uh, biodiversity, as I, I forgot to mention that we that the vegetation in the Antarctica is actually quite rich. We have lichen that has more than 200 species. We also have moss that has more than 100 species. And the rise in temperature, that probably, because, for example, because of the global warming, also has, has impacts on, on these species. Uh, the rise in temperature may potentially expand uh, the growing season of these species, which uh, uh, for them to expand the other uh, ranges in Antarctica, but also if we have rapid change in the temperature, the, the rapid change may, the temperature may exceed their adaptability thresholds. So in that case, the rise in temperature will negatively impact um, their survival and growth in the Antarctica. So it's very important to, to understand, to predict uh, the biodiversity in, in Antarctica to monitor the impacts of climate uh, on Antarctica and its biodiversity. So um, today we're going to look at a specific ice-free uh, region in, in East Antarctica. It's here, um, the Bunker Hills. It's near, um, actually near Australia and also near one of the permanent stations, um, the Casey Station that is managed by the Antarctic Austra Australian Antarctic Division. And this is a picture taken by Bruce Wilson during the summer for Bunker Hills. We can see these are the ice-free uh, regions surrounded by ice. And this is a satellite uh, image of the Bunker Hill. It gives a much clearer uh, view of the Antarctica. So the southern bank uh, of the Bunker Hills. So the Bunker Hills uh, uh, can be split by two regions uh, by, this, by this line. And this is the northern Bunga Hills. This is the southern Bunga Hills. And most of the species are living in the southern Bunga Hills. And we will be focusing on the southern Bunga Hills where we have some species there. And a little bit details about the birds and plants in the southern Bunga Hills. So we got, uh, for birds, we got four species that have been recorded in this region. So we have the snow petrel, 
the South Polar Skewer, um, the Wilson Storm Apache, and, and the Penguin. And these two species are the most abundant birds in, in, in the region. There are estimated 1,000 uh, individuals of snow petrel and around 50 South Polars. And they actually prey on snow petrel. And we also got lichens that have uh, around 41 species there, which is one fifth of the Antarctic um, lichens. And we also have uh, mosses, but the species are not reserved there. So they only found uh, mosses without identifying a particular species. So this table uh, presents the, some of the data source of the species found in the Southern Bangor Hills. There are several, we can see that there are several teams that have visited Bangor Hills and today we're gonna focus on two data sets uh, obtained from two in, uh, systematic in investigations um, in these two few seasons. The first one is the 1995 to 1996. The second one is from 1999 to 2000. And those are, and the data were collected at, uh, at, at the grid and, and the grid cells has one kilometer square area. And this is the locations of the survey sites of the Southern Bangor Hills. The, the solid circles correspond to the first few season, the 1995 to 1996. And the open triangles correspond to the, let, to the letter season. We can see that the first uh, survey actually covers almost all of the, the, the southern Bangor Hills, whereas the second one, they focus more on where they can find uh, species. And during, uh, and during these two few seasons, the data, the species they were interested in, in uh, were lichens. At the species level, especially, they focus on five relatively abundant uh, lichens there. And the data were uh, presence absence, meaning that they go to each survey site and then they, they try to identify these five species. If they were present, they record presence. If they were not, they, re, uh, they recorded absence. And we also got presence absence data for mosses. We also got uh, data for birds. But for birds, we only got presence only data because birds are, birds are moving. So it's very difficult to record the absence of the birds. So only have presence only data and they record presence of the birds when they saw the birds, when they, when they hear the birds or when they see the necks of the birds. So that's how they got the data for birds. And we, we got um, data for three um, birds there. Okay. So this is another view of the Bangor Hughes data. So I only brought the data for lichens and birds, but not only for the two field seasons, also for other investigation before and after the two field seasons. And we can see that they're very, the data structures are very different for presence absence data for lichens and presence only data for, for birds. For birds, the data, the locations where they found birds are everywhere. But for the lichens, it's more systematic because the, 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 the data collection process was, the data collection was conducted at a, at a regular grid. It's very, very difficult to do analysis that um, for data set that combines both uh, kinds of data, presence, absence and presence only. And we're working on that. But for this talk, we will focus on only the lichens where the data are more structured and presence absence, absence data are, more, are, are easier to, um, to analyze. So here are some pictures of the lichens in Antarctica. And lichens are very important um, species in, um, in Antarctica because they, they can survive in very extreme uh, conditions. So they are food producers in Antarctica. And also it is, they are indicators of the climate change um, of the Antarctica because if there are something changed in the lichen diversity, that indicates that might be something happening in the whole biodiversity in Antarctica. So it's very important to understand the lichen diversity in Antarctica. And for the lichens in Bangor Hills, we have uh, here are the species distribution of the five lichens. So we can see that the distributions are quite different across five five lichens for these three, um, they are relatively abundant, but for the, the two lichens on the right-hand side of, of this slide, we can see that they are much less abundant. 
And we can take a closer look, for example, for the, uh, for the region in, in the re rectangular, we can see that all of the species are actually quite abundant. But if we, if we look at um, here in the green, uh, in the green um, rectangular, we can see that the species, uh, all of them are less abundant. And even if we look no, uh, more north, we can see that the only one lichen here. So it's very important to, to understand why this is happening, why more, more, most lichens are, are able, were able to survive here, but not here, and what factors of the environment can contribute to, to, to what we have seen here. So in order to understand this, we need to use um, biodiversity models. So biodiversity modeling, um, I roughly classify them into two uh, categories. The first one is species level approaches, uh, which directly model the species, the spatial distribution of individual species and multiple species. And this is an example taken from one of my recent paper where we developed a geostats a model that can be used to predict um, spa uh, spatial distribution of individuals. And the, the, the example I use is to predict the abundance of Northern Cardinal, a very cute bird that is prevalent in Eastern United States. And this is um, the observations of these birds in East, East uh, United States. And the data was take, uh, taken from the North American breeding bird uh, survey. And the color of the circle indicates the number of birds they, they found. And we can see that the birds are more abundant along the southern coastal line here. And this is the, the spatial map that we produce after we fit the model to the data. So we'll be able to, to predict uh, spatial distribution of the birds, uh, it, uh, even in the, in the region where we didn't see anything, because of, probably because of some other reasons. And so this kind of approach focuses more on spatial distribution of, of species there are another class of uh, approaches that focus more on direct modeling for diversity indicators. And here are some examples of the, the diversity indicators. The first one is alpha diversity, which refers to the number of species within the habitat or local size. So we, if we have high number of species, we have more rich uh, species. The species richness is high, but sometimes simply looking at the number of species uh, it's not enough. For example, here we have two communities. Um, for the two communities, we have four trees, but uh, four, di four different types of trees. But for the second community, we can see that the third type is actually uh, much more abundant relative to the other three. So in this case, we need to look at the composition of the species that motivates the, the, the idea of using beta diversity which uh, is a measure of the difference in species composition between two or more habitats or local sites. And there are other um, diversity indicators, for example, gamma diversity and zeta diversity. Zeta diversity actually proposed by one of our collaborators, Melody. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on use um, a model to analyze the beta diversity of lichens. And before I go to the details of the models, I like to say that there are really no good or bad models for these two approaches. At the end of the day, we want to understand and predict biodiversity, for example, for policy makings. So when we make decisions, it's really good to, to hear different voices. So I think all of these approaches, all of these models provide different perspectives on the same problem. And we really need to uh, utilize all of, the, all of the perspectives to help us make decisions. So today, so today I'm gonna just introduce this, um, this model, the generalized dissimilarity modeling that is a very popular approach in ecology to, uh, to understand beta diversity. So essentially it's a regression model that relates the measure of the difference in species composition to the changes in environmental uh, conditions. So for the response data, we calculated using some dissimilarity index and the example here is the Sorensen dissimilarity index for presence absence data. And to calculate this index, we look at two sites, I and J, and we subtract this ratio from one. And, this, and 
Here, CIJ is the number of species common to both sites. And the denominator here are the sum of the numbers of uh, both uh, the species at both sides. So essentially, this ratio is the similarity between two sites. So subtracting um, this ratio from one gives us the dissimilarity. And the covariate data is just the environmental uh, variables, for example, temperature, uh, wind speed of snow cover, et cetera. And here's an example of using the GDM to analyze data. So here is, um, in this paper, they look at vascular plant um, similarity across um, Tasmania. And the GDM produced this curve. And the y-axis is the trends from the similarity. And the x-axis is the environmental variable. And here is the minimum temperature. And there are two features in this curve. The first one is this curve is monotonically increasing, which actually is one of the assumptions of using GTM, where, where we assume that if the environmental changes gets bigger and bigger, the similarity also gets bigger and bigger. And the second key feature is that this function, this curve is nonlinear. And the idea of using a nonlinear curve uh, to indicate uh, the response of the similarity to uh, the changes in temperature is that given the same amount of changes in the environmental variables, for example, the same amount of changes in the minimum temperature here, the response from the disparity can be different. For example, here, uh, when the minimum temperature is small, the transform disparity is bigger compared to in the second case where the, the, ch the change of temperature, minimum temperature uh, happens at, in, in a more extreme case when the temperature is, is high. So it's really, um, so, this, so, so this is the two features of um, this curve produced by the, uh, by the GDM. But before we fit the model, we didn't know this curve. So the goal of the GDM is to learn this curve uh, using the data. Okay, so, and this, and this is not, not easy in general if you wanna study how, um, how changes in in the environment, the environmental conditions can affect um, biodiversity. Okay, so are we ready to apply the model? Uh, the answer is no, because um, now, because we're working on Antarctic problem, there are some unique uh, challenges we have for the Antarctic problems. And, uh, a relative concept here is that the study of biodiversity is always scale dependent. And the spatial scale here refers to uh, the size of the region we're interested in and the spatial, uh, spatial resolution and the dimension at which the species data are collected. So the problem we have here is that the response data and the covariate data, they are not matched in terms of spatial resolution. So for the Bunker Hill species data, they were collected at a resolution of one kilometer square. But for the climate data we have, they only available at a resolution of five times 11 kilometers square. So they are not matched. So in order to apply the GDM, we need to match the resolutions. In this case, we need to downscale the climate data to the spatial scale where we, we, we collect the species data. And the second challenge here is that the Bangla Hills region is really small. So we have a very small data sets. So, so for, the, for the climate data, we only got 40 data points for this region. So in both cases, uh, either predicting, uh, either downscaling the climate data or fitting the model with 40 data points, it, we have a lot of uncertainties there. So successfully accounting for these uncertainties are very important for us to arrive at you know, a reliable conclusions for the, for the biodiversity in, in Antarctica. So we're gonna tackle these challenges uh, for the rest of the talk. So a little bit more about the cost of resolution and climate data before we propose our solutions. So climate data are often numerical model outputs. They, uh, this, model are, are, this model represent climate data in a discrete manner, meaning that they, they were produced at grid points. So classical models are, for example, general circulation um, models on the GCM, they are highly complex and they use a mathematical equations to represent the physical processes of the Earth's climate system, including atmosphere, ice, ocean, land surface, 
And because the, the, the whole physical process is very complicated, so it's very computation expensive to, uh, to run the model. So, if, so, so in this case, they can be only run on at a very coarse resolution. And in general, the, the resolution is, uh, is available at between 100 to 500 a kilometer. Now they might have some advanced technique to run at, at the resolution smaller than 100, but in general, they are available at, in, at this scale. And the GCM offers a way, offers uh, climate data for us to look at um, climate uh, in general uh, in a global view. But if you want to look at regional climate, then we need to use RCM, regional climate model, that takes uh, GCM output as the boundary condition for the model to produce a, region, a local climate. And for example, as you can see here, here's the grid here. And the regional climate uh, model, uh, uh, RCM, they are usually available at between 10 to 50 kilometers. So it's much finer than the GCM. And the issue here is that that, that these RCM are not available all over the world. So for example, if we wanna use it for Antarctica, these RCMs are not available. So in this case, we might turn to the third type of data, which is actually we, 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 will, use, we will use, is the climate reanalysis. Um, they, they, the, so, so, so the use of, of this climate product uh, involves the, involves computer-based model and data assimilation to combine historical observations from different sources such as um, weather stations to represent a, co uh, a coherent climate system. And the good thing is that they are available uh, everywhere. So for Antarctica, we can use the climate analysis for us to, to, to analyze. But, but still, it is available only at around 10 kilometers. So we still need to do the downscaling to match the, the scale of the uh, species data. So we need to do downscaling, statistical downscaling. So statistical downscaling generally refers to the use of a statistical model. Here we denote it as y equals f of x, where y is the fine resolution data, x is the cost res resolution data, and f is the model, a statistical model that we need to assume in order to do the statistical downscaling. And for some problems, the fine resolution observations of Y may be available. But for the Bunker Hughes, they're not available. So this even makes the problem harder for us. So it, it offers another perspective that we, that we really need to do uncertainty quantification. Um, okay, so, but, uh, so statistical downscaling is not physical process space like those are models I just introduced. It really depends on the assumption that we impose on this app. So when you use statistical downscaling, it's very important to, you know, to validate or to check that the assumption of your model you use for downscaling is okay or not. But in general, because the statistical downscaling is not physical based, it is computationally much cheaper. And it allows us to, to do downscaling at very fine scales. Okay, so let's go back to the downscaling for the Southern Bunker Hills climate data. So for the Southern Bunker Hills, we consider the ERA5 land reanalysis, and we will downscale the climate data to a resolution of one times one kilometer square. And recorded, we have 40 climate data points at a resolution of five times 11 kilometers square. So this requires that we need to predicting 40 times 55 values because this is 55. So it is 55 times one kilometer square. And this is a graphical illustration. We have 40 blocks of the temperature. The spatial coordinate here that corresponds to the stereographic projection. And in order to do the downscaling, meaning that we need to produce values on this very dense grid. And each block corresponds to 55 grid cells. Each grid cell is one kilometer square. So we're going to produce 55 different values based on just one single value. It's a very, very difficult problem. And, and even if we can utilize all of the 40 blocks here, we still need to produce 2,200 uh, values here. It's very challenging. It involves a lot of uncertainties. 
So a good downscaling method, a good way to quantify the uncertainty is very important here. Okay, so we're gonna do a simulation study to see if we will be able to, do, to, to tackle this kind of the, um, challenge. So the simulation study is to mimic what we have in the Bangor Hills. So I generated a fine, fine resolution field here over 3000 grid cells. And then I divide the fine resolution field into 30 blocks. So within each block, we have 100 grid cells. And then I aggregate the grid cells within each block to create cost resolution data. So we have 30 blocks here. And then we're gonna pretend that we only know the cost of resolution data, and we, we're gonna do the downscaling to predict the values over these grid cells. Okay, so we compare uh, two approaches here. The first approach is the Gaussian process that uh, use spatial dependence on downscaling, and the other one is the thin plate spines uh, that is commonly used in the literature for downscaling and it uses a smooth deterministic surface plus independence error to downscale. And both models, are, uh, they are fitted uh, using different algorithms. The GP is fitted uh, based on simulation-based inference, meaning that uh, we get, so for the models, we have some unknown parameters to estimate. So simulation-based inference gives a way, gives us the distribution of the parameters. Whereas for TBS, we use we use optimization, which gives us some estim estimated values of the of, of the parameters. So these are the two point estimation of the fine resolution field. We can see that in terms of point as point prediction of the fine resolution field, they look similar, except that the patterns here for negative um, for negative values in red, in red color are a little bit different here. But in, in general, uh, uh, overall, they look uh, pretty close. The difference is that for the GP, we, we are able to obtain an estimate a, a distribution of the, of, of the fine, fine resolution field. So here is the true field. And here is the four predictive fields of the predictive fields from the GP. We can see that they don't look exactly the same as the fine resolution view, but the fine details, the heterogeneity here, the pattern looks similar to what we have in the fine resolution view. And the difference, the main difference between the approaches for downscaling is in the uncertainty. So here we have the uncertainty of, from the two, two models, is the standard errors, and we can see that the GP produced much higher standard, standard errors than the TBS. And the crosses here are the centrals of the, the blocks. And another view on the uncertainty quantification is that is the 95% uncertainty bent. So the first row here is the, is the 2.8th percentile and 97.5th percentile of the uncertainty bent from the GP. And the second row is from, from, the, P, from the TBS. And overall, we can see that, for example, for the lower bound, the, uh, the GP gives a lower lower bound. And for the higher bound, the GP gives a higher higher bound. So in, in other words, the GP gives a much wider 95% uncertainty bands. So is it really good to have high uncertainty bands? Or is it OK to just have low uncertainty bands? We need to answer this question. So we answer this question by looking at the coverage rates of the prediction intervals given by GP and the TPS. So because we know the true data, we simulate the data, so we can see if the prediction intervals cover the true value. So we have, so remember for the five resolution view, we have 3000 grid cells. So we can, so for each grid cell, for each pixel, we can compare the true value and the prediction interval to see if the interval covers the true value. And we record it one if the prediction interval covers the true value, and we record it zero in red color if the interval doesn't cover the true value. So in this case, we can see that the GV does pretty well. It covers 92% um, of the true value, very close to the nominal um, percentage, the 95% of the prediction intervals compared to 
the TPS where it, it covers only 40% of the true value. So this shows that um, downscaling with accurate uncertainty quantif quantification is very, very important. So, so we now we have a way to do downscaling with accurate uncertainty quantification. The next question to, to answer is how do we propagate this uncertainty? How do we integrate this uncertainty to the next stage of biodiversity modeling? So this is what we propose. Um, it's very simple. We, in, um, we propose a two-stage protocol to, to integrate downscaling uncertainty into biodiversity models. So first we do what we just did. We do spatial downscaling with uncertainty and we obtain predictive samples of the fine resolution climate variables. And in the second stage, we're gonna propagate the uncertainties to the models. We fit the biodiversity model F independently and m times. And for each time, we use one predictive sample of the fine resolution climate variable. So in this case, we obtain a set of the estimates. Each one corresponds to one predictive sample of the fine resolution view. And these end up with the distribution of the estimates for the biodiversity data Y. So then, we, then this distribution of the estimates allow us to quantify uncertainty. Okay, so we have a tool to do the statistical downscaling and we have a protocol to, to propagate the uncertainty to biodiversity um, models. Now we're, now we're ready to apply the GDN with downscaling uncertainty to analyze um, lichen diversity and temperature in Bangor Hills. So I've just used temperature as an example. So remember that we have five um, lichens here and then I plot them together. We can see that mo uh, for just, um, just to give you an idea, we have more um, lichens here and, and less lichens here. And this is the histogram of the lichens dissimilarity calculated by using the Sorensen's uh, index. We can see that the mid and this, and this vertical red line corresponds to um, to the median of the dissimilarity index. And so the median is 0.2, which might correspond to, to, to this region where, mo where we know that most uh, species can survive there. So this dissimilarity should be small. And we also got some high dissimilarity here, which might correspond to, um, to this region where we, where we know that less species can survive here. Okay, so this is the statistical downscaling of the cause resolution temperature data. And we can then, and these six are the predictive samples of the temperature field. They are different, and especially if we zoom in to look at a pixel, each uh, for the same pixel, we have six different values. That gives us actually a distribution of the temperature at the pixel or at the grid cell. So this allows us to use the distribution of the temperature to understand biodiversity. And this is the summary of the, of the, the temperature view in fine resolution. And the left-hand side here is the, is the average. The middle and right uh, panels are the 2.5 feet and the 97.5 feet percentiles. And let's compare just the average of the ten, ten, ten temperature field with the spatial distribution of the lichens. So we can see that the, the, temp, the, the temperature here is, is moderate and here is high. So when the temperature is moderate, we can see that most of the species are, they are, are able to survive. But if we look at higher temperature here, we can see that the less species, um, less, less lichens are, are, are able to survive. And even and here, when we have a low temperature here, we can see that there's only one species, uh, one, one lichens here. So this is the result. So we calculate the Sorensen similarity index using the lichens data set from the two few, uh, two few seasons. We fit the GDM independently m times um, using the, the protocol we just proposed. 
and then we and then for the GDM, we call that the slope of the function implies the change of the biodiversity or dissimilarity here in response to the climate uh, climate change. So here is the curve that we we obtain from using the GDM. The red line here uh, is so the so the gray line here is each line corresponds to one predicted sample of the of the fine resolution temperature field, and this red line here is the point-wise uh, median of these gray lines. So it so the so, so the red line here gives us the average sense of how um, the disparity uh, responds to the changes in in temperature. So if we if we ignore the uncertainty, if we simply look at this red line, we can see that, for example, here, if we, if, if, if for the same amount of, uh, so given this, um, this, change, uh, this amount of change in the temperature, this, there's only a small change of the similarity here. But if we zoom in to look at the uncertainty, if we look at the other uh, predict predictive samples, for example, for several lines here, for the same amount of change, it is possible that the changes in in dissimilarity, the, the response of, from the lichen diversity can be actually a larger than we, we simply just, just look at the point estimate. So it's very important to quantify the uncertainty and this might help us to, to better understand what happens when we get extreme climate. Okay, so this is almost the end of the talk. And a quick summary, um, we propose the following framework that combines biodiversity modeling and downscaling. We have, we, have, uh, we have the distribution of the climate to help us to understand, to, to quantify uncertainty, as opposed to the traditional way where they just plug in the climate point estimate. And what we're doing right now is we try to uh, incorporate, try to quantify more uncertainties that comes from the data part, the data collection process. So in this case, the, this, the dissimilarity becomes um, a latent index. So we will be, so, so the way to, um, to quantify the uncertainty from the data is to, to create a data model and a process model. And this is what we're doing now. And thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Xiaoqian.